And hello everybody, it is I, Nico the Legend, also known as the Well-Mannered Teenager and the Snowflake. Uh, that's not a nickname that was given to me. Actually it was, I lied, I just tried to get away with it. I'm here with a very special guest. First time us ever talking to each other right then and now. And I'm very excited to have him on the show. This is the great John Paul Hayward. I almost said Edward. I was so close to saying Edward. I would have felt terrible. I had to stop the entire video. But welcome, good sir. It is a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, before we started recording, I was telling you this is my first time ever. I, I, okay, so on YouTube, first time ever doing an interview. And in, in, in life in general, first time ever doing an interview for a uh, musician, a composer. So it's a, it's a pretty thrilling experience i'm internally grateful for you being here um and uh, yeah. uh what was i gonna say um oh uh, this is where you have a script right <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was I doing, mean we were doing I'm so for, good i'm before. all for winging interviews let me tell you <laughs> um okay so john how about um you let people know uh where they can find you on the social media and everything and platforms. Let's do some quick plugins real quick, uh, real, real quick. Yeah. Well, so, uh, the, the two main places that I do anything on is Facebook and Twitter. Uh, my handle is at John Paul Hayward. Um, it's pretty <laughs> simple, I think. <laughs> and then, uh, Facebook, which I believe is John P Hayward. Um, and it's an, a musician artist page. And that's that's basically all I do. I mean, I have an Instagram, which is at Hayward Publishing, which is my business that I, I publish all my music through. I wouldn't say I'm super active, but it does exist if you're into that. All right, awesome. And then um, anybody listening or watching, uh, the links to all those pages will be down below in the description of the video. And, and another link that leads to the main reason why we're here. Um, I'm really, really excited to talk about this this amazing album that you created. Not to brown nose already, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about Cross Symphonic, a symphonic tribute to Chrono Cross, which, by the way, as soon as I saw that being advertised, I, I, I think it might have been, what was it, Materia Collection? Started, were they... Uh did they do the advertising for you or with you? No, I mean, that's a whole story in and of itself. But uh, no, Materia Collective actually has no official involvement with my stuff. Um, okay. However, I do have I do have somewhat of a history with uh, Sebastian Wolf, who is the CEO with Materia Collective. And uh, they very kindly helped promote the Kickstarter and some of the album stuff okay. um, when, it was, when it was first coming out back in 2019. Oh, man. And then here we are today, right? It's crazy. Yeah, two um, years later. <laughs> <laughs> so I I just, like, just like the rest of us, like, I, I follow Materia Collective and um, Game Chops and stuff like that. And, you know, and then a few other artists that have, you know, have published their works through those uh, publishers mm -hmm. or platforms themselves. And... I just I just remember seeing yours pop up in the feed of uh, I think it was I think it was Twitter, and it might have been the beginning phase or you're doing like a Kickstarter. Maybe this is when they were trying to promote you and getting people involved. And mm -hmm. uh, I was like, I, I saw what what the album was and I was like, no way, it's Chrono Cross. I was like, finally, something that's not Chrono Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> and like, don't get me wrong, like I love Chrono Trigger, but I'm sure you know as well as I know is that there are way too many like Chrono Trigger albums, like cover albums, symphonies. I mean, they're all great, uh, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's so oversaturated. So when I saw that it was Chrono Cross, because I always like I love Chrono Cross and Chrono Trigger. But Chrono Cross, I guess, maybe out of the two is like the black sheep in the family. So yeah. We, so people probably don't really go for that option because like Chrono Cross isn't as popular as Chrono Trigger or something like that. That's how I saw it. But anyway, I was... Always blows my mind. I, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But um, anyway, so I was... I, I, I like, you know, 
made my eyes widen. I was gonna say perk my ears, but I you also you might have had a song already released, or maybe that was a little bit later. But I, I mean, I I listened to it and I was like instantly hooked, and uh, um, that, that that's pretty much. And this was like back in the beginning, and um, yeah. That's how I knew who you were, and I was I was paying attention. Like I was really paying attention because I was I always like seeing the journey, <laughs> like from my perspective, you know, like the audience or <laughs> people waiting in line just to see, you know, the process of it, just getting release dates, like demos coming out or sample songs, you know, stuff like that, just to get people excited. So um, I like anytime it's it's uh, like. A musician that does a, a cover album or you know put their own twist on it like i always i like to be there along with the uh, for the ride you know that's the most exciting part and then when it comes out then that's the best part like that's just the cherry on top so yeah i'm just gonna fly out say i'm just gonna congratulate you on getting this album out you know oh thank you like um, uh, it Ambitious. This album was was an experience, let me tell you, and uh, not without its rocky roads. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, before we start recording, <laughs> you were kind of wanting to know, like, uh, how I was able to like reach out to you, or like where, why, or when type deal. So this is this this was interesting, and I don't know when it happened, like, uh, but. Recently, I was just like looking at my Twitter and like I, I like started to do I started to go into this phase of wanting to collab with other people uh, that, you know, maybe YouTubers or, you know, for example, now like composers, you know, or just content creators in general, artists like I just not yeah. just now got on that phase and like in the back of my head, I was like. I was like, "What about, what about that guy who did that Chrono Cross album, right?" Because it's been a while since I like <laughs> kind of like had to think of your name. I was like, "What was his name again?" And I was just browsing on Twitter, and I was on my profile page, and it's just like it said, "John Paul Hayward follows you." I was like, "Oh!" I was like, "What?" <laughs> I was like, "Really?" I'm like, "Okay." So this kind of motivates me even more to reach out to him, and that's kind of like. That's kind of like the uh, the silly part of it, and then I just sent you that message, and then boom, here we are. Um, well, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I, I just like a complete curveball. I'm like I was like I had no idea he followed me. Maybe I did before, but you know we're so <laughs> we're we're so distracted I'm, by just scrolling down or just doing like yeah, fifty other to things. To be fair, to be fair, I went through a phase. Um, I, I've never been a big Twitter user, like. I did the Facebook thing for a while in college, but social media, I don't know. I, it's, it's pretty polarizing and just distracting these days. But uh, I went through a phase when I, when I first started this album where I just mass went into Twitter and found every, every single person I could that was remotely interested in video game or video game music and just followed everyone. And I said, you know, these are the people that are going to be interested in what I'm doing. So I'm going to see you know, who bites and who I can form connections with. So it's actually funny that you seeing me follow you <laughs> is what triggered the interaction because that's exactly what I was trying to do by following all these people is yeah. to trigger interactions where we could talk about music and yeah. you know, share some, some similar interests. Yeah. And you know, um, not trying to brag or anything, but I'm a musician myself. So it's, 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 cool. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, I play the drums. I actually, whenever you see this video, there's a, like a mini uh, Casio keyboard, electric keyboard behind me that I started. I okay. started getting into piano uh, maybe like a few months ago, and that's been pretty fun because I've been playing drums for the longest time. And I, I used to be in a, in a in a punk rock band, you know, at, at senior year in high school, and it kind of lasted until like <laughs> 2015. Went into the studio, like this big time uh, studio in or Orlando, Florida, and d dealt with this producer editor mixer guy who was like really really mm -hmm. into his job and really blunt with what he said but it you know it, it had to be that you know no sugar coating but sure <laughs> basically we went in my band uh my bandmates and i we went in wanting to just record this set list of like five songs and then it at the end of the day, we came out with just one demo recorded. <laughs> and uh, I've been there. I've un I understand. <laughs> so so we spent like five hundred bucks 
gain this one song perfected. And it, it ended up being very, you know, beautiful song. Like, like this guy just knew his stuff and he did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. And he did it all in one day. And he usually said, you know, he told us, it's like, this usually takes about a week to like master this, mix it properly, right. volumes and all that. And I'm like, dang. Like, but that was that was the last time I ever did anything like in a band and produced music like that. Um, and then you know, I always get sometimes uh, I get the itch to write down a song or like hum some lyrics or something. But I never. That's pretty much it. Now music is just a hobby. Yeah. Um, so this is this is gonna be the fun part. How? What was your origin story, uh, John? On. Uh, we'll get to the origin story of, of doing the Chrono Cross album, but like you being a musician, have you always composed music? Or... Oh, man. Well, so I would have to say, I mean, I, I've been involved in music my whole life. Um, it, ever since I was even in preschool, we, you know, we had like wow. a preschool choir that that I was a part of with my, my grandpa was the conductor. Um, and then all through all through middle school, high school, and into college, um, and now I actually I still sing in choirs professionally with the uh, the Utah Symphony up until Corona hit. Yeah, of course, yeah. then you know no one's performing now. But yeah, yeah. Um, so so I I've always been in music. As far as composing, that's that's kind of funny. Because, um, I actually uh, at, in in grade school I started piano around age nine, mm -hmm. and I played that up through. Um, graduating high school and I hate I hated to practice <laughs> I was the least disciplined person on the planet I hated to practice and so you know when I was supposed to be practicing I would just diddle around and make up little melodies chord progressions things like that just for fun and I would I would guess that that's probably where I first started composing mm -hmm. um I didn't really uh, write anything down until high school. I took a music theory class, an AP music theory class, and they started teaching us notation software and things that we could do on the computer. I'm like, oh, well, this is kind of cool. And, you know, they would give us assignments where we'd have to, to write our own things. Um, and so, you know, I, I started diddling around there, and I had another buddy in the class with me, and we would, we would do these things called compose-offs where we would pick a theme and then give each other a week to just write a write a melody or something to to encapsulate that theme and it it was all really casual i guess it didn't really uh it didn't really blow up for me until college i had my sophomore year i was uh studying voice and i had an opportunity through a church that that i grew up in to do a religious album for for solo voice and orchestra and they they were kind of producing this thing and they knew that I, I kind of dabbled in this stuff. And, you know, I had some, some talent. And so they asked if I, I wanted to be a part of it. And I ended up arranging these and taking them to a conductor of, of mine in college who was also an incredible composer and arranger. And just asking him for some feedback. And he, uh, he looked at my stuff and he's like, well, um, I, I assume you're here because you want some feedback. You know, you don't want me just to tell you good job and send you on your way. I said, yeah, no, be... Be uh, critical. Show, tell me what you got. <laughs> and he, he tore it to pieces. Like there was more red pen on the paper than there were notes. Yeah. Um, and then he hands it back to me. He says, it's good for pop music. <laughs> and he says, oh. follow these notes and we'll make it actually good. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, for, for a lot of people, I think that he assumed that I would take that and, you know, just kind of be like, you know, whatever. What does this guy know? And, and move on with my life. Nope. And I went home that night and I completely rewrote the arrangement like from scratch Dang. and took it back to him the next day. And it completely like knocked his socks off that I, I would put that kind of effort to it and turn it around in one day. And uh, from there, that kind of showed me that I had an interest in things. Um, and of course, he uh, he became very interested in what I was doing and, and ended up mentoring me for the next four years. Wow, um, that's amazing. Which really, really jump started things. And then about a year after I did that project with uh, my church, um, I, had, I had another buddy that was going into film in, in college, and he was doing a short film as his senior project. And he asked me if I wanted to uh, score his film. And so I, you know, 
I moved into his house for a couple of days. I took my computer and everything and so that we could be working together while he's editing. And I scored his little 15 minute film, which I actually think is still on my YouTube channel. It's a little embarrassing, but, <laughs> um, yeah, from there, from there, I, I decided, well, Hey, maybe I don't want to be a performer. Uh, I actually really enjoy writing music. And so I would say that really long winded story is my origin story for composing. <laughs> wow. But that's, I like the best part is when uh, you didn't give up after, you know, your, your mentor, um, you know, like you said, tore it to pieces. And then that kind of, you know, it, it uh, broke you down, but then it built you back up and wanted to try even harder. That's, that was a good, for sure. That was a, I mean, that's good fighting. They, they're, there's a lot of rocks in this business that you have to overcome that. I mean, there's a lot of things that are just going to knock you flat. Uh, and I think, uh, it's, it's those of us that never give up that eventually, you know, make it to the, make it through, yeah. through the, uh, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. You have to get beaten down very hard. You have, yeah. I mean, you, but you have to, you have to keep getting back up. Otherwise you're, you're never going to make it in the business. And it's, it's like the same mentor. Cause he was, he was the, the chair of the choral department at the university of Utah. Um, and the same, same mentor actually got up in class one day and <laughs> somebody had asked him, you know, how do you succeed in music? What would you, what would you recommend? And he said, what would I recommend? He says, I would recommend that all of you get out of music and get a real job. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> after, after everybody laughed, he clarifies and he goes, music is incredibly hard. Most people don't make it in music and it's, it's a huge struggle. And I only advise people to stick with music if you absolutely can't live without music in your life. Otherwise, find something else you're passionate about and go be successful. And I think that's really great advice. And for me, it rung true because all my life, I've had other interests, casual interests, and I, you know, I'm decent at a few things, but nothing has really stuck with me like music. I mean, music is a part of who I am, um, and it's something that I, I physically need to survive. I, mm -hmm. You know, if I, go, if I go a couple months or something without interacting with music or doing something, I get really restless, I get really irritable. And so this is just, this is just a... A type of outlet for me that you know i i can't imagine myself doing anything else in life well you know uh music is a part of you you know it's a part of your character it's like the extension of who you are you know it's like yeah uh music is like the sword and you're the knight type deal you know it's like yeah it's been with you for so long and everything and you you know you don't want to let music down. You don't want to let yourself down. And then it's, <laughs> it's, it's just been in your family. You know, like you said, your, your granddad was a conductor, right? Yeah. Well, he, he taught high school, uh, orchestra and choir for however many years. And then he was also a, uh, concert pianist for a while in his younger years. Um, and he actually, he was, he was my piano teacher up until the end of high school. So I, I mean, there you go. It's just, passing along the torch which is which is always great um that's yeah. that's awesome and so yeah that entire that entire story was great i appreciate you telling me that that's that's awesome yeah for sure um, i mean like like uh simon and garfunkel say hello darkness my old friend and that's yeah. what music feels like sometimes yeah i mean <laughs> you're you're not wrong though i mean art just art in general is so competitive and nowadays, it's so easy to just make, you know, I'm just in general, to make something and post it somewhere, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. It, it's just well, and so available the, these days. The, sk the skill level required to make art, music, film, any of that is nothing like it used to be. And that's not to say that people aren't good anymore. It's yeah. just to say the bar to entry now is so much lower than it used to be that literally anybody can come in. It, it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's it, turned into quantity it, over quality pretty much. Yeah, well, it, but and technology has made it so easy to produce good sounding, good looking you know, um, products mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it's become so hyper competitive. I mean, I don't know how anybody survives, I, honestly. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's like winning the lottery almost. And that's... Yeah. And that's with like, you know, all forms of media and art, uh, you know, books or writing books or, you know, being an author, musician, a painter, uh, yep. a content creator like on YouTube or a streamer on Twitch. Just all that stuff 
it's just it just becomes instantly oversaturated. Um, yeah. But like you were saying, uh, you just got to keep plugging along, and then one of these one of these days, you know, you uh, you'll get that breakthrough, and someone out there that's you know someone's finally paying attention that's like this big time person you know could be a sponsor or uh another um musician who's big but likes your sound and stuff gave you a shot you know like stuff like that um and honestly networking is like the key to doing this to survive because you know for sure the whole sharing is caring thing it really makes a difference um yeah and that's that's how i see it like uh especially on like on YouTube or streaming. Um, I, I, I wrote a book uh, last year and I still have yet to publish it because, uh, you know, <laughs> for financial reasons, I can't do it yet. And there's still, there's a bunch of stuff, hoops I got to go through. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for sure. But I, like I know deep down when I bring that out to the, to the public, it's going to be a, a pain in the ass to just get it anywhere for someone to be like, Oh, eh. <laughs> you know yeah what's no that? you're you're absolutely right what's that the hero's journey ha been there done that i'll just watch star wars or something <laughs> <laughs> so no I, I mean it's it's funny that you say that because i mean that's totally how it is for everybody and uh you know the, the you can struggle uh, as a musician for years mm-hmm. constantly putting out things constantly writing music you know recording your own stuff out of pocket and never make it anywhere and ultimately i think you know Never giving up is important, but it's also it's also important to to find ways to be okay if you know you never make it big. Like I I know a few people that it really destroyed them when they gave music their all for ten years and it just never went anywhere. And they, yeah. you know, it it just destroyed their their being and they had to switch to something else. And you know, there's always kind of that I wonder what could have happened. So, well, that see that's the thing is that a lot of people they they. It depends on each person, of course, but a lot of times people expect to make it through that time that they're putting everything in, and like everybody gets that feeling, like, man, I put so much work into this. How come no one's paying attention? And it, it, <laughs> I, I can relate. So it's <laughs> it, it, you know, the the saying goes like a, a a pot never boils when you're looking at it, right? Yep. It's when you're yep. like least expect it, and you get some guy named Nico the Legend that reaches out to this this you know, wonderful musician named John <laughs> and then boom, here we are. Right. So it's like, I, I have my high expectations of uh, making it big after this interview, by the yeah, way. Yeah, Perfect. So I'll, I'll just <laughs> don't call, let me down. I'll just call a couple. You'll get a few knocks on the door. If they knock four times, just don't answer it. That's, that's, it's not a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I'll keep no, that in mind. <laughs> but, but seriously though, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's by who, you know, and you know, this, this partnership you have to make, this networking, and just, you know, it eventually just branches out, and you just, sometimes they'll come to you, other times you'll have to go to them to really get your foot in the door, Mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes you don't have to physically do that, like, sometimes your work will do the talking for you, and there's been, there's been plenty of, uh, you know, I'll I'll just say writers, because that's the thing that comes to my head, that, or artists, that have gotten famous prop uh, like not to go grim, but after they died, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. like yeah, HP Lovecraft, for, sure. for example, HP Lovecraft, you know, he was, he was a, like a pretty much a bum, poor guy living in the slums who had, uh, I think he had colon cancer or something. So the guy was a mess for the most part, but his stuff got really popular when he was gone, you know, and someone decided to really make it big. Some, someone to uncover it so it's sometimes it's like that uh it it takes a long time and there's i always go with the thing there's a time and place for everything as cliche as that sounds but and it also happens when you least expect it like well and i think it's important i think it's important to to really ask yourself why you're doing what you're doing i think if the end goal is to get famous i mean that that works for some people but ultimately I think most musicians can relate when I say that's not what's important. Uh, I don't think most of us really care about fame as much as we care about reaching people. Um, Just doing it. And at least, I, I guess, I guess maybe I should only speak for myself. But for for me, 
sh being able to share the music, being able to speak to somebody on on this ethereal level, um, that, that it really transcends language. I mean, music is such a powerful emotive tool. It's really cool to yeah. use it, especially in a in a storytelling type of way. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that's probably the biggest strength of my music is I'm I'm really I really focus and I'm really able to paint very vivid pictures, very vivid scenes, uh, and, and really tell a story. And it's so cool for me to to send that out to people and, and to get feedback from people about, you know, how they received it, what it meant to them, or, or even better to watch people experience it and see where it takes them. Um, yeah, that's, and that's, for me, yeah. for me, that's, that's better than being famous. Not to say that, you know, a big fat paycheck at the end of the month wouldn't be awesome. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> I, don't, the bonus. I, don't any, I don't think any of us would turn it down, but yeah, I, no. you know, that's not the goal. And yeah. that was never the goal with, with cross and phonic either. Yeah, um, so we can we can actually segue into that, but uh, before that, you know, there are two types of people in the industry. There's people that do it for the money and the one that do it for the love. And yep. I always I always tell people, you know, if if my stuff, let's just say I never get my book published, um, my YouTube channel never gets, you know, sets off, makes you know, gets super popular, whatever you want to call it. Being popular is subjective, but uh, yeah. As long as I try, as long as I did it, it's like I'll always have this book being done. You know, it's like my legacy. You know, it can be passed on. It can live. It can stand the test of time. It's not going anywhere. So, mm -hmm. you know, like people pass on uh, like legacy through like having a family, having kids, and you know, and they they live the ne the next part of your life. You know, through them. Sure. Uh, uh, doing music writing stories, movies and stuff, that stuff will last forever. And that's what's so amazing about it. I always recommend people, I'm like, hey, write a story, write a book. Like, I think everybody should write a book of some kind. It doesn't have to be long or short, just whatever, like a story. Um, yeah. You know, and it could be on anything because it's just, it'd be nice to know what goes on that head of yours. But obviously you can apply that imagination creativity to you know like how you did with music or someone does with uh you know painting pictures and so on uh, movies so on and so forth um yeah for sure i feel like everybody has that kind of story that creative story that they can put into whatever uh, uh how do i say um concrete uh, sculpture of some kind. I, I try to think of the proper thing to <laughs> say there. Um, no, I, I, I get you. So everybody's got that ability. It's just the, the, the sad part is always when they neglect that part of their brain and their imagination because it, it's it's there. It's there just waiting to be tapped into, you know, and then it, oh, just, for sure. it just takes you on this entirely different plateau, this this whole new, new universe that you never knew, knew existed. And you're like, well, not not to be the uh, not to be that guy that I always hated in high school that had to come and <laughs> preach about the arts. Yeah. But I guess maybe this is just a thing that comes with age. But you, you realize how important the arts are to us as human beings. I mean, there there are several studies that, that draw correlations to like music and higher test scores. And, you know, yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it exists with with visual arts as well. I'm just not as, you know, privy to that yeah. area of the world. Um, but yeah, it's so it's so important for us to even if it's not something that you want to do professionally or even something that you aren't all that interested in, just exploring that avenue of humanity and exploring that area of the brain has so many benefits to us as people. Um, I just I think it's a really important part of every every person's development. So uh, again, not to be not to be that guy that always drove me crazy when he had to come and give the speeches about how important the arts are in school, but really the arts are super important in school. <laughs> yeah. Art, art is your history and history always yeah. has many stories to tell. And that's what shapes us today. Um, you know, a picture means a thousand words, you know, it's, yeah. it has that much of an impact and that's why people get attached to stuff like this. Speaking of attachment, <laughs> and we're going to talk about cross symphonic now. This is going to be the juicy part. This is the part where I'm am most excited about because this is a fantastic rendition or orchestration symphonic tribute to one of my favorite games 
especially JRPGs or RPGs of all time, I'm going to go extra nerd mode here, and just music soundtracks in general. Like, I love Yashori Mitsuda. Gosh, 10 out of, uh, 1 out of 10 <laughs> on preparation. But he is, like, in, in the gaming world and just, just mu- in, in music world itself, he's one of my favorite composers of all time. Like, he's fantastic. So yeah, um, when I, just real quick, when I heard your album, like, I knew right away that you really cared about his work you took your time you now you can correct me if i'm wrong maybe this is like you did it like overnight (laughs) or something but from from my perspective and from me listening uh you treaded carefully not to let's just say butcher the legacy in some way you know that i appreciate that this was something this this was a game that which (laughs) obviously we'll get to in a moment Mm. that really meant something to you what this guy did for you, uh, you know, gr- probably growing up, this is probably something you heard, and it just, boom, you made this album to show the appreciation of this game, this soundtrack, this this composer that you look up to, and I, like I, I I see it, I hear it, I feel it. That's what you want. You want people to feel <laughs> the music. That's that's the whole that's point right. of making music is people feel it, and that that's how I felt when listening to your stuff. Like you did it. Great job. More brown nosing, but you did a great job, you know, <laughs> retaining that that uh, that connection that people got when playing Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. You know, the soundtracks oh, in those you. games are just masterful. So this is nice, a nice rendition extension type deal. Um, so here's the big question. How did you even get to making Cross Symphonic? What's like the 101 of this album? <laughs> well, that's a uh oh, hold on sorry someone just walked in <laughs> it's okay is that Masuda? <laughs> yeah, Masuda, I, I forgot your name i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> so you, you'll have to edit that out for me yeah yeah <laughs> um okay so uh just for memory's sake will you rephrase the question again sure sure so how did we get to making cross symphonic like, how do we, like, what was the origin story of that? And what just, you know, the inspiration behind it. Pretty much the 101 of it all. Oh, well, I mean, that's, that's quite the question to unpack. Um, and it's got a bit, of, a bit of a history to it. Sounds good. Um, well, like, like basically every musician that uh, has ever enjoyed video game music, Mitsuda and Nobuo Umetsu are two of my biggest inspirations. <laughs> I don't blame you. It's, um, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, um, and so I grew up playing Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger, um, you know, especially during my uh, my elementary days. Um, and I've always had a really strong connection to Mitsuda and his his music. I feel like uh, he's a really honest composer. He, he writes um, music that really speaks to people. And I, I don't mean to, to downplay his music. It, it, it's, it's kind of more... Uh, I got I to stop and reword this. Yeah, that's <laughs> Before okay. I dig a hole. <laughs> Remember, if you hear <laughs> four music... knocks on your door, it's over. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And I know it's him coming for me. No, no. He's, he's a really fantastic composer. And I know that he's spoken about being more of a minimalist composer, mm-hmm. um, he, t- he tends to like to use as little compositional technique and instrumentation as possible to still convey his point effectively, mm-hmm. which is a real art form in and of itself. Yeah. Um, but I've always felt like Mitsuda's music is really honest and pure and raw. and It's not overthought. It's not overproduced. Mm-hmm. And that aspect of it has always really spoken to me. Um, it it lends itself to really strong melody writing, which was always really memorable for me as a listener. And it's something that I would always sit and play with, specifically Chrono Trigger. I would sit and play with and listen to a lot as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, to the point where, I, I don't know, I'm sure you said you're a huge fan, so I'm sure you're familiar with Chrono Trigger. But when you get to the end of time and you have all the different characters, mm-hmm. if you talk to them to join your party, they'll, it'll play their character theme. Mm-hmm. And I used to sit there with a kid, as a kid, and uh, take an old cassette player, <laughs> which I'm showing my age here, and I would record each character theme so I could listen to it later by myself <laughs> without playing the game. 
Um, so so I, I have a huge, huge history with chrono music. And growing up, um, I was always really uh, interested in orchestral renditions of video game music. And around that time, you know, things were starting to get kind of big with Final Fantasy. They were, they were doing their concerts in Japan in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where they were orchestrating mm. some of Nobuo Umetsu's work. Yeah. Um, that stuff was always really exciting to me. I always loved it. I would, I would search it out on iTunes for hours, just trying to find rips of it on YouTube, <laughs> just somewhere where I could listen to it. And then the Distant Worlds album started coming out, which were really kind of like the big symphonic treatment for Final Fantasy, the first like big orchestral album. And that got me really pumped that, oh, well, maybe we're going to get a really, you know, banging Chrono Trigger album here yeah, yeah. in a couple of years. And I waited and waited and waited, and it never, it never came out, and it never happened. And so, you know, I kind of, I kind of dismissed it. Well, I had started playing Chrono Cross in, like, early high school um, as my... It, it was kind of my transition into PlayStation RPGs. It was one of the few. And it's, I instantly fell in love with that game. And like you... Um, I prob- it probably holds an edge over Chrono Trigger for me in terms of just being one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. I, feel like, I feel like the storytelling, the setting, the music, all of it is Chrono Trigger, you know, but level 11. It's, it's just one step above. Um, I instantly fell in love with the game, and I played it up until my mom walked in on me once, and <laughs> she, saw that, she saw that the characters were you know, swearing and whatever, and that was new in video games, and it was a big deal to my mom. She's like, oh, I don't want you to play that anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> That's um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. But anyway, so I, I rediscovered Chrono Cross again in college when, when I was like, oh, you know you know that game I used to play? I really liked it. It's Chrono Cross. I should play that again. And I don't know if there were literal tears, but there were definitely emotional tears by the end of that game, I, the yeah. story completely captivated me. The music is incredible. Um, the characters, the setting, all of it. And, and I, it quickly became one of my favorite games. And I said, you know, it's, it's, it's almost criminal that Square has not done anything with this music. I, and so, I'm with you on and that. And so I, I, I thought to myself, I'm like, you know... I, I don't feel like I'm in a place compositionally. I don't feel like I'm a good enough composer yet to take this on. But one day, I'm going to do a Chrono Cross album. Or a Chrono... I, I think it was originally a Chrono Trigger album. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a couple years, uh, the Final Symphony albums came out. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Final Symphony album. Um, uh, it's I haven't produced heard of by, it uh, it's, it's produced by a German group. Um, it, it's incredible. Honestly, it, it's an incredible piece of music. They have, they have a symphonic poem on there called Born with a Gift of Magic. It's a symphonic suite from Final Fantasy VI. And mm. it's seriously one of the coolest pieces of music I've ever heard in my life. You should go check that out. Uh, anyway, that, that whole thing really jump-started me. I said, you know what? That was, that, that was awesome. I think it's time. I think now is the time. I'm going to start working on my Chrono album. And that was probably, I don't know, 2017 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, no, sorry, it would be like 2015. Um, anyway, I uh, started kind of messing around some things. I had heard um, Blake Robinson, he's another, he's another VGM guy mm-hmm. in England, that he, he had just done the entire Chrono Trigger soundtrack with orchestral samples, giving it his own orchestral treatment, every single track. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's a really cool idea. I'm going to do something like that with Chrono Cross. You know, everyone's done Chrono Trigger. There's, like you said, umpteen million cover albums out there. So I'm (laughs) going to do Chrono Cross, because if you search Chrono Cross, there's like two. (laughs) And and none of them are orchestral. They're like people's piano covers, which are fine, but I'm looking for the symphony. Yeah, it's it's a crime. And so... I wrote I wrote three tracks or so that never actually got released where I just took, you know, the first track in the soundtrack and orchestrated it and the second track orchestrated it, etc. And then and then um, between listening to Final Symphony and getting inspired by uh, another VGM artist named Sam Dillard, who I ran across the same year. 
um, he had he had released a Chrono Trigger album where he had kind of turned it into a film score, and I went, "Holy crap, that's a cool idea!" <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so I'm like, maybe I can meet that somewhere in the middle. Maybe I can take the classical music that I've been studying, that I've been learning to create, and the classical world that I've worked in, and I can merge that with this film score idea and create essentially a soundtrack for a Chrono Cross movie that doesn't exist. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and that's really, that's really the beginning of Cross Symphonic. Uh, from that point on, I went ahead and just scrapped the three tracks that I, I had already written and started over. Um, and this wasn't till I don't know, late 2017, early 2018, when I really started working on this. Um, and I think I got three or four tracks in when, when I finally started realizing, well, you know, I'd re I would like to release this just on Spotify, iTunes, and all these things so that people can listen to this. You know, what does that entail? Uh, and that's, that's when I started digging into the world of licensing and all of that jazz and ran across Materia Collective mm -hmm. um, for the first time. And I reached out to them asking just some general questions about licensing and I sent them a couple of my mock-ups and you know just just asking for some general feedback mm -hmm. and they wrote back and were very interested in the album in general and they're kind of like well hey what if what if you recorded this with an orchestra and I'm just like I could never do that they're like oh, it's not as hard as you think you know people people like this stuff they would fund it we should do a kickstarter and I said oh that's all oh that's a great idea and we uh Material Collective and I communicated for several months after that, and ultimately we decided that a partnership was probably not the best relationship at this point, and I decided to, to go at it alone. Mm -hmm. um, but from, from that point on, I had been casually writing you know, a little bit on the weekends, kind of every night after work, things like that, slowly pumping out tracks. And then it wasn't until the end of 2018 that I was like, all right, well, I've got to get this done. And I, I started dedicating full time to it, and, and the majority of the album was probably written in three months or so. Wow, and that's like that's you're talking about like all the sheet music and stuff, right? And just... Yeah, so I I am more of a traditional composer. I know a lot of people will compose inside their their DAW, their digital audio workstation, um, you know, their programs, Cubase, yeah. Sonar, Reaper, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I was never. In that space, I've, I learned in Finale, which if you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a music notation program. It's for actual sheet music. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where I was comfortable. And so I spent a lot of time figuring out how to, how to uh, pair professional-grade virtual samples with Finale sheet music notation so that I could write in traditional notation and have you know, Hollywood-style mock-ups play when I was finished. And and I've come up with a really great system that allows me to do that, and it's yeah, it's it's probably a little bit longer than if I were just right inside my DAW, but ultimately it cuts out a step if you ever plan to take this to a live orchestra because the sheet music's already done, mm -hmm. which which was the plan with Cross Symphonic. So so I got it written. Um, we launched a Kickstarter, or I should say I launched a Kickstarter, <laughs> and. <laughs> yeah, yeah. immediately found out that I had not done my due diligence with the licensing as I got a personal message from uh, Yasunori Mitsuda himself <laughs> oh, <my laughs> so on, on Twitter saying, excuse me, you haven't licensed this. I mean, in so many words. <laughs> oh, my and and I, I immediately realized what was going on because I, I, I had every intention of licensing it. I had put it out there that I was going to license it. I had explored and found the avenues I needed to go down. And I had, I had crossed all my T's except for the one where I actually had reached out to Septima Lay, who is Yasunori Mitsuda's uh, publishing company that holds the rights to Chrono Cross, and informed them that I was going to be doing this. <laughs> yeah. and, and so I had not received permission to go ahead with my project. And uh, I, got a, I got a personal email or a personal Twitter message from Mitsuda asking me to please contact his company and explain what is going on. <laughs> and so at that point, I immediately shut down the Kickstarter um, and I contacted, I contacted uh, Septa Malay and they were extremely gracious with me, extremely understanding, wonderful people. I feel like I got extremely lucky. Um, they listened to a few of my mock-ups and they sent them to Mitsuda. 
and they sent back an approval and said, you know, this this sounds fun. Go at it. Wow. That's and, so and that, cool. <laughs> it, it was it was really cool, but it was also a lot of no sleeping for a few days and just constant dread that there was going to be a lawsuit in my mailbox the next day. That four knocks, <laughs> man. The four knocks are coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And so, uh, yeah, so once, once I got approval, it was pretty obvious that I didn't have the audience to meet the goals, the, the funding goals that I was asking for in the original Kickstarter. Because I had really, one, once I wrote this thing, I had really latched onto the idea that this could be really cool if I wrote it in more of a classical film score type of way, kind of like John Williams, who's another huge inspiration for oh, me. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, you know, when I was writing this, I was really trying to marry together Mitsuda and John Williams music. Um, and so, but, but what comes with John Williams music is massive orchestras. We're talking like 90 players on a stage. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what I had budgeted for. And that's, that's what I really, really wanted for this wow. project. And ultimately, after I had to cancel the first Kickstarter, I mean, the writing was on the wall. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> not, not, with the, not with the exposure that I had, which is basically nothing. I mean, I was a newbie coming onto the scene from nowhere. I'm lucky anybody gave me any attention at all. Um, right here. And so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. And so, uh, and so I, I restructured and, and I came up with a way to, to get this recorded. We, we, I talked with a couple family members and friends and we restructured and came up with this idea to launch a tiered Kickstarter system mm. where if we met the minimum funding goal, we would record live stream players and then we would just do virtual instruments for everything else. And then if we met the next funding goal, you know, we would add woodwinds or brass and then et cetera, et cetera, until the full orchestra was being recorded. Yeah. Um, and so when the, by the time the Kickstarter ended, we had reached the minimum funding goal to do live strings and live woodwinds. Oh, okay. And not quite, we had not quite reached brass. And I was like, all right, you know, whatever. This is cool still. We can get it done. I feel like my brass samples are pretty good. And I got a I got a message from John Robert Matz, who's a part of the great the Game Brass. Okay. He had also he had also supported the Kickstarter and followed the project a little bit, and he had been looking at the updates. You know, I was I was scheduling the uh, recording sessions in Los Angeles for the orchestra, and he says you can't use MIDI brass. And I said, well, I <laughs> I agree, but I mean, this is what I've got. And he says, no, no, I I am a part of a group. Let me help you. I mean, I'm paraphrasing here. Um, right, right, right. And he sent me a few examples, and he's like, we can record this, you know, without blowing the budget. Wow. And I was skeptical, and they sent me their stuff, and I listened to it, and I went, oh, wow, they're actually really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we, ended up, uh, we ended up signing an agreement, and they recorded the brass remotely after the fact for Cross Symphonic, and it, it absolutely transformed the music. I mean... Wow. It, I don't think I don't think the album would have been anywhere near what it was without them, and so of course af after that point I'm like, well I can't use a fake choir, <laughs> <laughs> and so so I uh, you know I I sunk a good chunk of my own money into the project at that point, and called in every favor I possibly could from everyone that I've sung with since the end of time, yeah. and we put together a choir in Salt Lake City and recorded that for the album, and. Uh, let me tell you that it's an A-list group of singers that, that oh appeared gosh. on that. Dude, that's freaking awesome. I, I'm like, I'm still like, still back in the, at the part of the story where Masuda sent you a, a, a like a message on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, it's cool and really depressing at the same time because A, I mean, he's a childhood hero and he's been a, he's been an inspiration for me forever. I, I love his music. It's, I would say, He's probably the composer that has shaped me and my my passion for music more than any other composer that I can think of. Yeah. With ex the exception of maybe John Williams. But so so getting a message from him was incredibly cool because I'm like, this is the man, this is the the myth, the legend himself. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, the message was, hey, dude, you're stepping all over my toes. What's up? <laughs> so, <laughs> but see, I'm like. But see, John, I, that, not... that's that's sometimes what it takes, man. Um, 
I, I know, <laughs> I know, I know. That you is were, not the uh, right, right. That is not the message I ever wanted to get <laughs> yeah, from him. That's all right, I'm saying. Yeah, not, my, I did not want my first interaction to be, uh, "Are you trying to screw me, bro?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. But see, now, now he'll always remember you, whether it be good or bad. Like any any press, <laughs> any any press is good press. Uh, that's how I see it. So uh, I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but. <laughs> uh, no, regard regardless, he was he was incredibly gracious. I mean, obviously, yeah. there's a huge language barrier. Um, as I tried to explain myself to him over Twitter, yeah, uh, you know, it, it he was he was very he was very gracious and gave me contact to the president of Septima Lay, which I probably never could have gotten myself. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's so it, he gave you know, it worked out. Yeah, that's it, it worked out. It, it was it was a huge boost. And they, they were really gracious and understanding. I explained myself to them and they said, OK, I think we understand. Let me talk to let me talk to Mitsuda and get back to you. And from there, it was, you know, it was a really productive relationship because the way I wrote Cross Symphonic, I mean, if you listen to it, you'll notice in each track there are several different themes. Yeah, yeah, and they all kind they all kind of play together. So it's not like track one represents just one track from the album. I mean, yeah. I think track one on Cross Symphonic has seven or eight themes from Chrono Cross in it. Mm-hmm. Well, in the world of licensing, <laughs> that <laughs> that's a nightmare. Let me tell you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not only is it a nightmare, it's incredibly expensive. I mean, once you start getting that many themes onto a track. You're almost paying more in royalties than it's even possible to make if you were if you were keeping 100% of the profit. Yeah. So that. they were they were extremely gracious with me and willing to work with me um, to make it manageable and, and to get it out the door. And moving forward, I mean, I, there there are plenty of other games that I want to give the same type of treatment to, but I mean, moving forward without that kind of relationship and someone willing to help me make it work. You know, Cross Symphonic will probably remain something really special in my my catalog just because I don't have those connections to companies like Square Enix. Well, this is your first album you ever released, right? Uh, actually, it's my third studio album, but it's my first um, video game album. So you always remember your first video game album uh, or just this type of, uh, you know, path you took to get this out first video game album so it it it, it will always yeah hold a special place in your heart and for sure you definitely well, and it's chrono chrono cross which is yeah one of my favorite games and soundtracks of all time so um exactly and you know this is it was a crash course for you pretty much and this and this kind of uh you know project you, you were doing so there was um the good thing is you survived, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got it out the door and, you know, um, me and many others are enjoying it heavily. It's great. Um, it's, it's a good, yeah, it's, the, the fan response has been incredible. I, I remember when I first released it, there was a lot of uncertainties, um, on how it would be received because some of the themes in there are extremely different from the game. Like the, uh, the frozen flame, for example, yeah. which I, I represented in the track battle for the frozen flame is like the exact opposite interpretation of how Mitsuda wrote it. <laughs> and so, I, uh, <laughs> well, and so, and so, so I, I never knew how those type of things were going to be received. Cause I know that this is a, a pretty sacred soundtrack to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I wasn't here to reinvent the wheel. No, no. I'm not, I'm not trying to improve on what I already consider to be one of the best soundtracks ever. I'm simply trying to reinterpret it into something different. Yeah. Um, That's yeah. You were putting and, your own spin on it, you know. Your own right. Own. Well, and 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 this this whole project was a huge passion project for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I first pitched it with Materia Collective, and I was first talking about it with family and friends, you know, I, I was I was very clear about my vision. This project was to pay tribute to a game that meant a lot to me as a person, and to really just send a love letter out into the universe to, you know. To show to show uh, how important this music is to me, how much I love it, how much it means, and you know everything else. So uh, it was never it was never really about success, popularity. All of those things would be nice, but it, it was always about just putting the music out there and letting it exist in an area that I feel like has been extremely neglected. 
and it was um, just it's just out of respect you know you're paying so you're paying tribute. yeah it's, it's so so the the fan the fan response and i had some people at the chrono compendium which is a uh, website dedicated to just chrono stuff mm-hmm. they they latched onto this project and were cheering me on from the sidelines for a good six months before the album was released mm-hmm. um I honestly, I, I don't know that I would have finished it without them because it, you get to the end of something like that and it just feels like it doesn't matter anymore and you're tired and deadlines and whatever. Life happens. Yeah, and yeah. without without knowing that there were others out there like me who, who just wanted to see the music out there and, and to see something new and exciting exist around this IP, I'm not sure that it ever would have gotten done. So, I mean, their support and other support means a whole lot. Yeah, and, uh... and like I mentioned to you on... Uh, one of our previous conversations before while we were setting up this interview, uh, ironically, Square Enix released a Chrono Trigger slash Chrono Cross album like a month before Cross Symphonic came out. <laughs> of course. They finally <laughs> care. <laughs> they, I, I was going to say, after, after all, of this, all of this time and all of this fretting and waiting and hoping and wanting, I finally go through the motions to do it myself. And then a month before I finish, they surprise drop this great chrono cross chrono trigger orchestral box set and i just went oh well i mean i hope there's space in the universe for both of these (laughs) yeah yeah they i i made a video just talking all about like when chrono trigger turned 25 and they didn't do anything there was no like celebration there was no like yeah happy birthday chrono trigger or this and that yeah they did nothing and Yep. Uh, did nothing, you know, Chrono Cross is definitely the biggest sin because they haven't been doing anything with that game since it released back on the PlayStation One. Uh, yeah, so well, and, and that's where that's where some of my stress came from too, because 2019 was the 20th anniversary of yes. Chrono Cross's release in the United States, and that was a milestone I really wanted to hit with this album. Like, the, I mean, the timing was perfect. It wasn't even intentional. It just happened. Um, Life's interesting that way, huh? Yeah, it so so it it just happened that way, and so I'm like, well, I have to hit that November date. Mm-hmm. You know, I've I've got to hit that release date. It's perfect. It's like the universe set it up for me, <laughs> and yeah. that caused its own its own amount of stress. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just because, and I mean, of course, the the project is still not quite finished. I, if you followed it at all, you'll know that the vinyl has been going through vinyl development hell and is still not finished as of yet but that is uh that is still a process <laughs> it'll it'll get there man it'll uh it'll happen when it when uh it chooses to right uh, it's certainly not for lack of trying but the good yeah. news is i think we're finally uh we're finally about there awesome well you know best of luck to you on that man that's going to be another big step with this whole thing getting it out there a lot more yeah there have been a lot of really patient and understanding people um, waiting for this that will be absolutely thrilled to get it and I hope that I can deliver I've done everything within my power uh, but you know vinyl is is a new frontier for me and it's been a, it's been a learning experience for sure yeah uh, it's it's been an experience for for all of us you know I speak I'm sure I speak for the people that have you know pre-ordered the vinyl buy your music listen to it you know we're all just, we're all just extremely proud, man. <laughs> um, well, I appreciate it. <laughs> so a uh, couple of closing things I wanted to ask you before we uh, finish up here. Um, I, sure. I just want to say like uh, before uh, <laughs> I ask that, um, I, I, I'm completely with you on Mitsuda's music. And uh, we don't have to go so far into this, but it's kind of like an add on when you were talking about his music meaning a lot to you. I'm like I'm with you on that. The, he's the main reason why people got so attached to those games. There's this oh 100 percent. There's this some kind of like journey you always go on with with just his music. You know, like his music creates its own world, and mm-hmm. it so happens that the game does a good job representing that. And it's it's so innocent when you listen to his music. It's very innocent. It, it soothes the soul, whether it be something like heavy, like, you know, boss battle music 
or just yeah. traveling from like I don't know uh, town to town and the over uh, overworld and stuff. And mm -hmm. well, you, and that that's the it, that's the purity that that I was talking about too. I think that you're you're talking about the yeah. you're, you're picking up on the same thing. Yeah. It just has a purity to it, a raw honesty, which is just so unique to him. There's yeah, there's a lot of love behind it, and you know, yeah, uh, poor guy Mitsuda, he got two stomach ulcers from working on Xeno gears and and Chrono Trigger, <laughs> and then, then yeah, uh, Yumatsu had to take over. It's just like. This guy was stressing really hard too back in the day with Chrono Trigger and Xeno Gears. It's so, you know, you guys have that connection when it, turn, it comes to stress levels, deadlines, and stuff, and maybe you know stress. <laughs> well, I never developed any ulcers. I think that he definitely had had yeah. the worst end of the stick on that one. Yeah, um, but uh, the fact of the matter is that you guys, you know, he probably understood where you were coming from when. You know, you got everything worked <laughs> right. out with him and stuff. You know, I'm sure he felt honored because I, I always feel, you know, I would a normal person would would feel flattered uh, if something was made in their honor and stuff. Especially, you know, when it comes to Chrono Cross and stuff. So, well, uh, I certainly hope so. And and I I, I had the opportunity to uh, to send him a, a copy of the CD when it was all finished. Any um, any response? Are we waiting? Still? No, I, I I didn't hear anything. I I was really hoping that it you know by some miracle it would really move him and he would write me a personal thank you. But you know that's dreams and wishes. <laughs> in 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 the world in reality, uh, I'm yeah. sure he listened to it and I ho I really hope he enjoyed it. But he's a busy guy. He, you know he's got yeah. deadlines of his own and things to do. Yeah. So that that's all. That but it, it is it is really cool knowing that I was able to send him a copy and I like to imagine that it's sitting in his collection somewhere. Yeah, that, that's that's awesome. Um, okay, so last last two things. Uh, first one's first question is well, it might be a difficult one, but I think the last one's going to be pretty difficult. But the first one, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, your favorite song on the album that you felt like oh. that you loved the most. This is tough. This is like picking your favorite your favorite like son or daughter, right? It's like the way you know. <laughs> well, I mean, there there are days where. Uh, it feels like they're they're the stepchildren, you know, the ones that you yeah. you, you put under the under the cupboard like Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that's a tough one. Uh, there there are things that I really love about several songs, but I would have to say, oh, not to be cliche, it's probably a toss up between Le Radical Dreamers or Scars of Time. Oh, dude, um, dude! I was just gonna, I was gonna tell you, my favorite, one of my favorite songs on the album is "Radical Dreamers." Um, yeah, that one to me is probably the most emotional piece of music on the album. Oh, for and, sure. And Marie, sure. Marie, that did the vocals for that, just absolutely nailed it. And when she sent in her recording the first time, I mean, it was just constant chills. And this is and, someone that, and you, I knew that you know, right? Personally. No, actually, I had not known her at all before this project. <laughs> and, um, That's awesome. So I, I had an idea. I had an idea of who I wanted to sing this part. I had an idea of the voice that I wanted to sing this part. And so uh, I scoured YouTube and I, I sent my brother on YouTube hunts because he's big into into like the indie world on YouTube. Yeah. Just to find all these different, you know, as many people with this voice type as he could find. And then he sent them to me and I, I went and did my own research. And we, we ran across uh, this YouTube channel, and I think it's M-R-E-E, -E, and she goes by Marie, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and she had this Kingdom Hearts cover. And I was like, that's it. That's the voice. That's perfect. Yeah. And so I, I wrote her out of the blue. She lives up in uh, Oregon, I think. Yeah. And I, I just I found her contact page on her website, and I just sent an email out of the blue. It's like... Hey, you know, I'm doing this album. I would, I really love your voice. Would love to have you sing. And totally, just like this is a long shot. And she <laughs> responded to me in like five hours, and is like, "Oh, I'm interested. Send me some details." And from there, you know, I mean, the rest is history. But yeah, yeah, I had, I had not known her at all before that's, this project. That's cool, man. Yeah, that's Radical Dreamers is fantastic. Like, I, I can understand why you, like, I, I love it when there's like a couple songs out of albums or like covers or that have just like someone singing like that the entire time. It's just very, yeah. very emotional. Like you were saying. So awesome. Good. Well, and good she, find. she, she, na she nailed it. Um, 
and and it is it is just an incredibly emotional track i think uh and it honestly not not to toot my own horn but i think the arrangement is just stellar and I, that's more tribute to mitsuda than anything for writing the music I think. <laughs> uh, it yeah, just yeah. i don't i don't i don't even know where the arrangement came from honestly i just wrote it and it was luck i guess <laughs> yeah. because i got done and i listened to it and i went this is such an incredible piece of music and i'm not just talking about the arrangement i'm just talking about the piece of music in general and marie really took it and brought it to life from that point yeah um, i think that's great and then scar for, for scars of time the reason why it's a toss-up is because that song is so iconic and i don't yeah. know that there's a better adventure song in my opinion out there <laughs> than scars oh, of time no. oh my gosh like uh, in, in Chrono Cross, uh, when you're running around out like in the overworld or on your boat, I'm like, man. Yeah. How did, well, it, how did and it, I, I oh, had? Sorry. Oh, I I had a uh, I had a couple of people ask me why it's the last song on the album because Scars of Time is the first thing you hear when you start Chrono or Chrono Cross when you yeah. put put in the PlayStation disc. Yeah. And ultimately, it's because the goal of this album was to tell a story. So I wrote each piece to try and follow the story loosely from the game clear up into until the end and scars of time to me felt like the perfect closer you know it's like at the end of star wars when bam the title pops on the screen and they play the title theme all over again yeah, yeah. that was my that was my scars of time moment oh um, and cool. and I thought it, I thought it was really effective personally but I don't know I still have a lot of people be like I don't know it should be the first track <laughs> I mean if if people remember you're opening a book in Chrono Cross, right? And then yep. eventually it's got to close. So maybe you saw yep. it like that, but that that's great, man. I mean, they're all great songs, but yeah, Radical Dreamers is just one of my favorite. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. I, I was going to ask you. The last I, I was just, I was just going to do a couple of shout outs for other tracks that deserve. Sure. Um, By all means. That deserve. Maybe not the favorite title, but there's some of my favorites. And uh, track number three, I think, is where Cross Symphonic, it's called A Theft for a Life. I think that's where, where my focus uh, really narrowed on, uh, and my the, the, the conceptual idea for the album really came into focus. The Hermit and the Dragon is a fun one, which, again, was another turning point in the album for me in terms of the writing and where it was going. Um I also really like where time stands still. It that one has uh, a lot of really poignant moments, I think, and some of my favorite string writing on the album. And then, of course, uh, the next three tracks are fantastic as well. <laughs> Battle for the Frozen Flame, The Orphan Dreamer, and Duel with the Dragon God. I thought were all a lot of fun. Actually, Duel of the Dragon God won Best Orchestral Cover um, at the mag is, is it is magfest i think really awards yeah that it was nominated um as best orchestral cover and it won best orchestral cover in in 2019 dang um, gg man that's great yeah it was a, it was a really it was it was a really cool moment and i actually couldn't attend um just because of some personal things but yeah. but john robert matz happened to be there and i and he he accepted that on my my behalf that's awesome. So, you know, I just listed like half of the album and <laughs> the other half is good too. So I guess just go listen to it if you haven't and you be sure to drop me a line and let me know what you think of everything. Yeah, that's that's awesome, dude. Yeah, I appreciate I, pre I appreciate the honesty. I always like hearing, you know, the artist side of things on like what they like to. Um, uh, last, final question. I This, uh, this might be an open-ended one, but maybe we could summarize it real quick. Um, Deep down, I hate to put you on the spot even more. Are you happy and proud of this album that you released it? Are you <laughs> are you satisfied with your work? That's such a open ended question, but um, and this isn't um, like a way to like burn your bridges or anything. You're like, nah, I, I, I effing hate it, you know? No, 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 no. I understand. Uh, well, like, it's that there's there's I, there's a twofold answer to that one. Yes, I am very happy that this album is out there, that it's done, that it's something I did. In fact, it's led to numerous opportunities in the past two years that I never would have run across if had I not gone through, you know, the process of making Cross Symphonic. Oh. And so, yeah. regardless of how Cross Symphonic was received or how well it did, um, it was an incredible experience, and it was it's one that I would do again. That being said, the second part of your question was, 
am I happy with my work? Well, <laughs> that's a loaded question because yeah, yeah. is any artist truly happy with their work? <laughs> yep, that's yeah, it's very. Uh... <laughs> so, don't don't get me wrong. Uh, Cross Symphonic was a huge moment of growth for me, both as a both as a, a businessman and a composer. Yeah. Um, lots of learning along the way in both aspects, and for that, you know, I experience is the greatest teacher. I think. And uh, I don't know that I could have ever learned that any other way. So Cross Symphonic represents a moment in time for me and a moment uh, that uh, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> That's OK. I like it, I, I like. No, that. no. It, 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 rep it represents a moment in time for me and it represents a point in my in my career as a composer. And I think I will always look on that fondly, regardless of uh, where I go from here. That that was good. That's a great answer. Like that's that's perfect. You did it fine. <laughs> like that was such a that it, was such it took a, two tries, but you know. Yeah, that was such an open ended question. I knew that it was just really kind of bland and you know. But uh, I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you were able to you know condense it into something really nice at the end there. So I appreciate that. <laughs> no, like that that's I mean, that, that's it, an answer that could lead to like a whole another interview. <laughs> It's like such a psychological yeah. question. Your listeners will be so tired of hearing my voice by now. Um, <laughs> never. I'll, I'll give them four <laughs> knocks on their doors, right? <laughs> so, no. um, yeah, I just want to say it's been a pleasure having you on here to meet you for the first time digitally, you know. And, hey, Likewise. Yeah, Likewise. Maybe one day I'll just bump into you and be like, hey, you that guy, huh? You're, the, <laughs> yeah. you're that guy who did the cross chrono album or something <laughs> some real jerk about it you you wouldn't be you would be surprised how many people still think that my album is called chrono symphonic which is an album that a youtuber did many years ago it has no relation to me <laughs> <laughs> you're that guy i knew it i hate that guy no but uh <laughs> so yeah blessed to have you on here man uh, i had a great time Thanks for just taking the time out of your busy schedule to hang out with Nico. And yeah, not a problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it, you're very welcome. And I'm just, I'm just glad that you know, uh, both of us had this opportunity to get to know each other. And then who knows where the future will take us, right? Not to sound like a uh, for sure. Not to sound like a <laughs> uh, you know, fortune cookie or something. But uh, this, <laughs> well, this, and this if, was fun. if you know if. Not to not to plug myself a little bit, but if you and your uh, your fans enjoy my music and you have enjoyed Cross Symphonic, this is only the beginning. That's all. That's all I'm going to say right now. But this yeah. is only the beginning. I have I have plans. <laughs> <laughs> some some are closer than other. So yeah, keep no, an eye out. I'm I'm excited, man. Like you got me hooked for sure. So um, if if you want to get on my uh, my good side, just do a uh, a symphonic tribute to Final Fantasy IX because that's my number one favorite game of all time. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nine is a fantastic game and it has a fantastic sound. <laughs> so I will neither confirm nor deny <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that I will do a Nine soundtrack at some point. But I will say I have done an arrangement of Nine in the past. Sweet, you hear that, folks? Nico's double dipping. <laughs> 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 all right um and just real quick um just i i know you said at the beginning of the interview but just a reminder where can people find you uh for my music the best place is twitter uh it's where i do the most self uh, advertising <laughs> and that's at john paul hayward and then i also post pretty frequently when i have things to share on facebook and that is at John Paul Hayward Music on Facebook. Awesome. And then um, uh, if you guys want to do what I do when I listen to them, mainly, you can find them on Spotify, no problem. You just got to type in Cross Symphonic. And, of course, I will uh, do the work for you guys. I will post the links down below. So in case, you know, uh, I don't know, something happens, uh, Spotify is hard to search through. Because sometimes it is hard to find people's albums in Spotify. Yeah. Um, are you on uh, are you on Apple Music at all? I am. So all of okay. my all of my releases should be on all major platforms: Apple Music, Spotify, what used to be Google Play, which is now YouTube Music. Um, okay. Cool. I believe I actually have the I have them released on YouTube as well. 
Deezer. Yes, you do have um, them on YouTube. I, I saw them. Good stuff. Good yeah. Stuff. Um, and so, you know, it's out there. I also have Bandcamp, which is where the album re- released originally. And on Bandcamp, you can actually still buy uh, a hard copy of the CD with some really fantastic album art by Rowie. And nice, cool. you, you can buy the vinyl edition, and we still have a couple posters available, too, if anyone's interested in that. Sweet! Sign me up! <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome, awesome, man. All right, once again, thanks, uh, John and Paul Hayward, for your time, and we might, we might do this again sometime. You never know, right? Yeah, for sure. You, know, you never know what's coming down the pipeline. All right, thanks, man. Appreciate that. See you guys later. I've been Nico the Legend.